Thank you. I'm delighted to see you all here so early in the morning. It is early, so this it's um, uh, hopefully not a sacrifice for you to be here because I think this talk will be fun for you. So as a veterinarian in practice, and as all of you are veterinarians, I think that you will agree that to your clients, one of the most important things to the client about their pets is health. And so someone is purchasing a purebred puppy, what do they really care about? One would hope that they would think of the health issues. So this first question, uh, Dr. Bell is gonna run some polling here, is the responsibility to improve the genetic health of domestic animals rests with, and Terry will do this, which I okay, don't know so, how to do. So for the polling, uh, you need to turn on your cell phones. <laughs> and uh, the best way to go is to go to pollev.com slash OFA VMX. And the question will just pop up and you can just tap your answer. Or if you want to text, you're texting to 22333. In the body of the text, you want to send OFA VMX and send, and then you only have to do that once, and from then on in, all you have to do is type A, B, C, or D uh, for your answer, and, uh, and then uh, that would come up. So uh, to a web page, pollev.com slash OFA VMX, or texting to 22333, you text OFA VMX once, send it, and then A, B, C, or D, and then send. So we have four people so far. So if any of you are technologically challenged as I am, try to find a young person near you to help, help you. So who do you think it's, is the responsibility to, remove, to improve health? All right, we have how many people now, Jerry? How do you tell? Lower right. Lower right, lower right. Okay. It looks like we're pretty complete there. I would argue that while there are no wrong answers in this group, it's everybody's job. The who drives what gets purchased? The public. So our job, I believe, in addition to doing all the things that we do when it comes to being a veterinarian and keeping dogs healthy, we have a big responsibility to educate the public because the public has a right if they demand it to make sure they are getting healthy dogs. Look at this, polling. All right, so veterinarians certainly play a part, but we often see them after they've purchased the puppy that is problematic. So I'm gonna move on here. Maybe not. Okay, Jerry, I told you I'm challenged. Aha, all right, roles and responsibility. Our role as a veterinarian is to educate breeders and clients to help them think of things before they get into a real big pickle, for breeders to help them practice health-conscious breeding, and breed organizations. In addition to my other roles, I'm also the vice president of the Labrador Retriever Club. And for those of you who are not heavily involved in purebred dogs, you should know that in the United States, the American Kennel Club is the governing and registering body for purebred dogs. But within that group, there are parent clubs, and the parent club is the mentor for people within the breed to make sure that the breed is meeting a certain standard of looks and performance, which implies that they should have a certain degree of health. We are quite different from Europe, where in Europe, the kennel clubs are often owned by the government. So here in the United States, the AKC is not directly related to the US government in any way, which may be good or bad, but we can make decisions separately from the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, since the United Kingdom owns the Kennel Club, they set breed standards. That does not happen here. So our role, again, to the public is to help them to seek out health-conscious breeders in procuring their pets. I like to talk to clients who call our clinic and aren't already our client about how to teach them how to even look at a website and from clues on a website to decide whether the breeders are conscientious and doing the right kind of health testing or not. And that can be a real eye opener to you if you look for some of your clients at where they're buying their dog and they think they're doing such a good job and there will be all kinds of red flags to you. 
So to manage genetic disease, what's the best way to select for genetically healthy offspring? Healthy parents produce healthy offspring. It's very straightforward. All genetic disease cannot be prevented. However, we have knowledge and tools to improve the genetic health of our puppies. So this is our new bumper sticker, which I think says it all. Health-tested parents for healthier puppies. Um, Dr. Bell's wife actually came up with that logo, and I think it's great. OFA is now the Canine Health Information Center. So we are the world's largest database for genetic disease uh, <clears throat> testing information that there is. And our goal is to help everyone learn how to keep their dogs and their puppies healthier. So what role do you play? As a veterinarian, you're a significant source of information to the breeder. Today we have to uh, compete a bit with Dr. Google and all of the Facebook chat groups who tell people how to do a good thing, but realistically, we are the people with the knowledge that can really help them. We can influence the decision to breed dogs at all and to breed dogs ethically. If I have a client come to me as a theriogenologist saying, I have a golden retriever, and I think it would really be a lot of fun to have a litter of puppies, I have a whole list that I have them go through. First of all, I say, are you aware of the health testing that should be done in your breed? And typically they will say, well, she's a really nice dog. I just think she really should have a litter of puppies. I then say, are you prepared to take back every dog that you sell for all of its life if it doesn't work out in its usual home, in its initial home? Really, they say, yes. Are you willing, and I say, this is a theriogenologist, because they, I say, why do you want a breeder? Well, we think this dog is perfect. We love her more than life itself. I said, then don't breed her. Pregnancy is a big stress on multiple systems, and pregnancy is fraught with what could be a disaster. So if you love her more than life itself, don't breed her. Spay her and enjoy her for a long time. You won't have the risk of the dystocias, et cetera, et cetera. And so I say, if you couldn't stand it, if you couldn't live with yourself, if she died whelping, don't breed her. So there are lots of criteria that you can say to the client about doing it. In Minnesota, we have a very, very stringent, what is called lemon law. And it describes the, re the financial responsibilities of anybody who is a breeder to the person who purchases that dog, whether it's purebred or crossbred. And I point out to them that doing it poorly in addition to being morally unacceptable, can cause them huge financial um, liability when they end up paying for hip surgeries because their dogs did not have hip clearances, which can happen in Minnesota. So we're also to the, we're a significant source of information to the prospective owner when we say what to look for in a breeder and how to purchase a puppy. You don't want people going getting five week old puppies somewhere you don't want people going on the internet and having, well, it's harder to ship them in now, but buying puppies sight unseen without information on whether these breeders are doing a good job. Throughout history, following the domestication of dogs, man has shaped dogs to the desired size, shape, behavior, and temperament through selective breeding. And dogs today are the most genetically engineered species on the planet. From the little tiny chihuahua to the Irish wolfhound, why do dogs look the way they are? And I am going to cover a little bit today on some of the brachycephalic breeds, which I breed Labradors. I happen to own a pug, and he, is, he could be called um, a rescue pug. All the things I tell you about that you shouldn't do, I didn't do when I got him, but he's 13 years old. Why do people like pugs? They're cute, and they're funny. And I think people have a right to have pugs, but you can get very healthy pugs. My 13-year-old pug, excuse me, <clears throat> pug in Minnesota can go all the way to the pond with the Labradors running. He's a great breather. He has no trouble breathing whatsoever. So all pugs don't fall over from hypoxia. This is my pug. Isn't he handsome? That's Hobo. Managing genetic disease. Across all disease processes in dogs, genetic disease is about 25% of our disease processes. And I want to make you aware that genetic disease occurs as frequently in crossbred dogs as in purebred dogs. 
I think there's two factors in that people perceive that purebred dogs may have more issues. Number one, if you were to track dollars, purebred dogs are more likely to receive more and better veterinary care than our many crossbreds. And that is probably associated with a perceived value of a purebred dog to begin with. And also, they, we don't subject them to the same screening tests. In a study at the University of Missouri in Columbia, and it was actually a retrospective study, where they looked at hip dysplasia in their population. The screening criteria was that any dog that came into the Missouri Veterinary College for anything related to lameness at all that had a, a, a VD pelvis view. And they found in the crossbred population that came to Missouri, the incidence of hip dysplasia was as high as it is in purebred dogs. So being crossbred doesn't mean that you're going to be healthier. With the trends now of all the doodles, which as a Labrador person, of course, drives me crazy, doodles are not inherently healthier, nor do they have less problems with hip dysplasia, with epilepsy, with any of the things that the doodle people say. And I will go on record as saying that F1 doodles do shed. That's the number one reason my clients think that they want a doodle. They want a dog that doesn't shed. They are not always so thrilled when they have the dog that bloats and has seizures, but they think the hair stays in. <clears throat> so in order to manage disease, <clears throat> you have to think about the purebred dog and what is the advantage of a purebred dog. Purebred dogs have predictable physical traits. You can be pretty sure that a pug is not going to weigh 50 pounds. You can be pretty sure that a Labrador is not going to weigh 10 pounds. They have fairly consistent behavior and temperament. And most of the breeders, particularly the breeders that I deal with and Carla and many of the others in this room do, do health screening prior to breeding. Crossbred dogs have 215 known genetic disease predispositions. So any gene that is responsible for uh, ancient traits is going to come across all breed standpoints. So to manage genetic disease, you have to have a lot of information. You have to know the mode of inheritance, if it's known, the availability of genetic screening tests, both genotypic and phenotypic, prevalence of the defective genes, the severity of the disease, and the breed pool size and the diversity of the breed. Is it always possible to manage genetic disease? No, there's not always screening protocols. Let's think about two diseases, bloat and epilepsy. I think we would all agree that as a community, huge numbers of dollars have been spent researching bloat, and we still don't have answers to bloat. There have to be many factors that we don't understand. And then we also do have complications that arise from late onset diseases. Where do you go for breed-specific testing information? So we are going to, you'll do it? Okay. Okay, so another poll. So if you're on the web page, a box t um, opened up, just type in that box and send it. If you're texting, just uh, text your answer and send it. If you uh, were not here for the first poll, if, you're, um, if you can go to a web page, pollev.com slash OFA VMX, um, the question will pop up. And if you're texting, you're texting to the address 22333. Uh, you're going to put in OFA VMX and send that. And then after that, you're just going to type in your answer and send. So we have, where do you go for breed-specific testing information? OFA, Parent Breed Club, Chick, Parent Club website, laboratory, OFA website, genetic disease book, laboratory. I think we should add one. In case you haven't seen it, Dr. Bell has written a fabulous book that lists all of these disease predilections by breed and also includes the cat breeds. Dr. Google, there. Yeah, Dr. Google, that's the best place, right, Dr. Google? Dr. Google will tell you everything. But he has a fabulous book that lists all of those all in one place. But it's an old book, and I'm not writing a second edition. <laughs> Okay, so. All right, so we have some great answers there. I'm happy to see that some of you do know about OFA. So, What is a dog breeder? According to the dictionary, it's simply someone who breeds dogs. Again, another dictionary definition is 
the owner of the mother of a litter. So that encompasses just about every, dog, every puppy that you can think of, which means that a breeder isn't necessarily somebody who has 50 dogs or 100 dogs or two dogs. If you have a bitch and she has a litter, by definition, you are. Again, with the dictionary definition, someone who breeds dogs, they may be purebred or mixed bred, purposeful or accidental. Who breeds? What motivates breeders? In the accidental breeders, um, we had one of those quite recently. In fact, I had a vet student externing with me from Lincoln Memorial, and a client brought a bitch in that he, she thought had something wrong with her GI tract. And what she had wrong with her GI tract was that she was pregnant with a single puppy and she was, it had a dystocia. So that's about as accidental as you could have. The client's comment was, that can't be. That dog is her brother. So, <laughs> but in fact, that was about as accidental as you could get. Casual backyard. We see this a lot, unfortunately, in Labradors, where two hunting buddies decide, oh, we'll just have a litter of puppies. They've put no thought into it, no thought of where the homes are going to go, no thought about any of the diseases that Labradors might have, and all of a sudden they have a litter of puppies, and they have puppies with one of the genetic diseases like CNM, and they are in a sad place because CNM in its worst forms is really not compatible with quality of life. So the casual people know health testing is done. Selection criteria is based on convenience. I have the best pheasant dog that you've ever seen in South Dakota. So you have the best pheasant dog in North Dakota, so we're gonna produce wonderful pheasant dogs without any concern for their health. Their motivation is either financial or emotional. And in dog breeding, I think there's at least as much emotion as financial motivation to do, do, to do some of the breedings that are done. In the commercial high volume breeders, that is a business. And while I am not a fan of commercial high volume breeders, there are high volume breeders that can do a very, very good job, that do health screening, that do great socialization, and have facilities that promote great health of their puppies. Then the last group is the group that I would say I am in, and many of you here are, purposeful hobby breeders, and we're motivated by a passion for a breed, thoughtful selection, and a desire to achieve quality. It does not inherently equate to responsible breeders. And I would like to point out to you, I think this to me is a really important issue. You can be a breeder who has one dog and do it poorly, and you could be a breeder who has 100 dogs and do a great job. What determines that is your resources and your commitment and your facility. So do not be quick within your own practices to criticize people for numbers of dogs. You have to know the whole picture. I can tell you that I know people who are hobby breeders who have one or two dogs, and they do a terrible job. So it is not a numbers game. It is a commitment and desire and education and love game. Responsible breeders are committed to health issues. We're committed beyond providing puppies with their first shots and worming them. Even commercial breeders do not want to produce puppies that will eventually go blind, are lame, or seize. But actions that we take in the beginning can help to minimize inherited diseases, and serious, dedicated breeders will take those actions. They're going to feed properly. They're going to screen properly. They're going to screen for temperament and health. So for responsible breeding, the selection criteria are confirmation traits, type, and soundness. I've all, I say to my friends all the time, I would much rather feed a pretty dog. So, I mean, there are some wonderful, ugly dogs, but personally, I would rather feed a really, really beautiful Labrador. I want breed type, I want soundness, I want a Labrador that everybody can live with, with the right kind of training. I carry about the per pedigrees, I carry about working ability, I want these dogs to be able to find birds, pick up birds, etc., and they have to be healthy. So this is my granddaughter with one of my bitches. Um, this is a very old picture. This is correct Labrador temperament in the whelping box with humans. 
I would be very upset if I had a Labrador bitch that would not let humans handle her puppies. Now, another dog near those puppies, that's a different story. Protect them. Is this typical temperament for all breeds? No, there's going to be breed differences, but I think, again, the good breeders are going to look at the breed dogs that they have and see if the temperament is, a, so, is appropriate for the breed that they have. I've said to many people, I love the Labrador breed. I grew up in German Shepherd dogs. And I will tell you that Labradors are in the special ed department as far as intelligence, whereas I would say that German Shepherds and many of the working and herding breeds are in the gifted and talented. Now, there are differences within that breed. But you need to know something about the breed and what they are. The Labrador is extremely adaptable, extremely trainable. I don't think they're rocket scientists. I love the breed. When I think of the OFA, I think of what do you think of? So here's another polling question. You know how to do that. Tell what comes to your mind first. While you're working on the poll, I will tell you that when we started out, it started out purely as a HIP database registry. A database, we have HIPs, health screening, health testing database, genetic testing, ortho, eyes, cardiac, and skin, comprehensive resource, great. I will point out to you, we are not a registry. We are a health database collection facility we are not a registry. We don't register any dogs. Look at all of this. Hips, elbows, pre-breeding, genetic testing, chick. Overall genetic testing. So our mission statement at the OFA has expanded hugely. Again, to go from the very, very beginning with hips, OFA was founded by John Olin who was a noted sportsman, and he loved his Labrador retrievers. So he provided the early seed money that started the OFA because he was concerned with hip dysplasia in his particular breed of dogs. From there, as all of our genetic testing has expanded, the OFA mission and our role has expanded hugely. So you see, this is our new logo, OFA, the Canine Health Information Center. We're a source of information to a lot of you. We're a not-for-profit organization established in 1966. Philanthropist John M. Olin's dedication to the sporting breeds. And our objectives are to collate and disseminate information concerning orthopedic and genetic disease of animals, advise, encourage, and establish control programs to lower the incidence of orthopedic and genetic disease I'll just mention that we don't come up, OFA, we the OFA, don't come up with a test and try to impose a test upon the public or upon the breeder. The groups, the parent clubs come to us asking us to maintain a database or within the specialty groups, they come to the OFA asking us to establish a database. So I want to make it clear that we're not out there to sell tests. We gather the information as requested by the important people within the world there. We encourage and finance research in orthopedic and genetic disease, and we receive funds and make grants to carry out these objectives. Our objectives are met through a core service providing radiographic evaluation by board-certified veterinary radiologists for hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, leg calf, Perthes disease, and shoulder OCD. The OFA databases and website are a tool for breeders to make more informed breeding decisions, and we do grant funding. Uh, we partner greatly with the Canine Health Foundation, which has been wonderful, a wonderful partner to work with and really fund some very, very important genetic research. In grant funding, we have funded over three million, including direct research funding to the University of Missouri, Michigan State, and Cornell. We have grant sponsorships through Morris Animal Foundation and the Canine Health. Oops, let's go back there. Uh, this last year, we just uh, sponsored a AKC Canine Health Foundation Clinician Scientist Fellowship. We uh, fund the Purina National Parent Club Health Conference, and we 
fly vet students from all over the country in to learn about purebred dogs and appropriate breeding. We have an endowed scholarship at the University of, Minnesota, of Missouri and educational programs at national specialties conferences and sponsor SAVMA. I will be speaking at SAVMA in March, which will be in Athens. OFA, the Canine Health Information Center. It's a voluntary diagnostic service. It's a data bank for genetic health status for dogs and cats and is the world's largest animal health database containing genetic information. Importantly, it's semi-open, so it is a real tool for the committed breeder or the veterinarian. Today, our mission statement is to improve the health and well-being of companion animals through a reduction in the incidence of genetic disease. These are just a few of our databases, hips, elbows, patella, leg cab perthes, congenital cardiac disease. Again, that database came up because the parent clubs wanted some way to register, uh, I'm sorry, to list health testing for hearts and the cardiology group came up with that original form. We have a thyroid database, congenital deafness, sebaceous adenitis, and shoulder OCD. How early can dogs be radiographed for hip and elbow dysplasia? So what age can you send your films into OFA? Let's see how well you all do on that. One year, six months, prelims before two, 24 months, 12 months. The answer is prelims can be submitted anytime after 16 weeks of age. Now, a, a prelim is just that. That dog is not certified until age two. But it's important for you to know that OFA does read screening hip films. So it makes it very possible to do early screening to help select for health in your potential breeding partners. And then just touch this, Jerry. Okay, we also have DNA databases for genetic diseases, PRA. Um, that database is for, is for the PRCD form of PRA, which is the most common across breeds. Canine, CMR, which is canine multifocal retinopathy. Two diseases that Labradors get, centronuclear myopathy and EIC, which are neuromuscular disorders. DM, which is a, a a neurologic disease, progressive lens luxation, von Willebrands, and many others. So if there is a test for these, we will ha maintain a database. All of these diseases, no, that's not true, but many of these genetic diseases that we have databases for are inherited in a simple autosomal recessive fashion. New, new databases are added at the request of breed clubs or vet veterinary specialty organizations. For instance, the uh, Scottish Deerhound Club of America asked us to add a serum bile acid database because they have great concerns of, about portosystemic shunts in that breed. That was not something we said you need to do this. We added a tracheal hypoplasia database at the request of the Bulldog Club of America. And then the advanced cardiac database was developed at the request of and in cooperation with the ACVIM. That particular database also allows the cardiologist to gather um, and compile database across all dogs because they have a central place to send incidents. In veterinary medicine, we are terribly lacking in incidence data because there is no central reporting area. So if you were to say to me, what percentage of Labradors have tricuspid valve dysplasia, no one could tell you. What I can tell you that is if a Labrador is gonna have a heart defect, it's likely to be a TVD. But no one knows that because there's no central reporting data. When establishing new databases, the OFA consults with, sub with subject matter experts to define the testing protocol and diagnostic outcomes. The we OFA website is your most complete source of information there is our um, web. You can search for an animal by name or registration. These are mine. Uh huh. So we'll trade off, and here comes Jerry, and he has some good ones. 
Thank you, friend. Yeah. So I am going to go to the OFA website and uh, show you what's available to us. And if you haven't been to the OFA website in a while, you're going to see a, a big, big difference because we completely revamped it. Okay, so this is the OFA website, and it is um, health tested parents for healthier puppies. And uh, we have here what genetic health screens do my breed have? What are the health statistics for my breed? What health screen results are recorded in the OFA database? At the bottom here, we have um, links for breeders, everything a breeder needs to know, everything a veterinarian needs to know, and everything that potential owners need to know. Uh, I want to show you. Here is the graphic here, health tested puppies for healthier, health tested parents for healthier puppies. And you can download that graphic and put it on your hospital website and show that you support health conscious breeding and that you do OFA um, screening in your practice. And it's uh, something that you can market and it's something that you should be proud of that you are involved in, uh, in establishing uh, the way to have healthier dogs. Okay, so I want to show you here, um, well, we can do it under what are the health statistics for my breed. So here are all the different breeds. Someone name a breed? Golden Retriever. Golden Retriever. Okay, so we'll go to Golden Retriever and the health stats. And so it shows here the ranking amongst all breeds that have at least 100 dogs in the database, the number of valuations, abnormal, normal, carrier, if it's a DNA test, and if there's an equivocal. So for the advanced cardiac, which is the new cardiac registry where only the um, ACVO, um, I'm sorry, where the ACVIM cardiologists are filling out the forms, um, there are 3,580 uh, uh, dogs that have been evaluated, 98.4% normal, 0.5% abnormal. Um, uh, this is the uh, regular cardiac registry where you can uh, sculpt and, uh, and fill out a form, and there are over 35,000. We have 99.1% are normal. These are not necessarily uh, for these type of stats here, not the advanced one, but for cardiac, for patella, uh, for a lot of the OFA databases, um, the owner has to send in the information, and very often they won't send in an abnormal uh, uh, finding, so these are probably under-reporting the actual incidence of disease. Um, we have them tested for degenerative myelopathy. Um, there's a dentition database, 2.4% have some uh, dentition issues. Uh, elbow dysplasia, 11.4%. Uh, there's a, uh, there are two types of PRA, um, and you have no affected, but 2.2% carrier of type 1 and 3% carrier of type 2. Hip dysplasia, 19.9% uh, are dysplastic out of over 156,000, and, uh, and so forth. You have other DNA tests. Um, you have a lot of DNA tests and things that are available for uh, golden retrievers. If you want to look up statistics on any of the uh, different databases, such as hip dysplasia statistics, here we have it listed from the high, from most dysplastic to the least, and so you can go down through the list. It also shows this is all of the data from the, um, in the OFA database, and then this is the five-year period, 2011 to 2015. So you can see trends that in bulldogs, 71.2% dysplastic, there are the kind of dystro uh, dystrophic breeds have more hip dysplasia because of their uh, configurations, um, but the last five years um, period, they're 65.9. So those numbers are going down. That's a better trend, and so you can look at things like that. Okay, I want to show you, if you go to about here, health surveys. Okay, someone name a breed? What is it? Pugs. So the OFA does health surveys at no charge for parent breed clubs. 
We have a template survey that pretty much covers everything, and then the breed club uh, will add things that they want in there that they want to know. And then uh, it's online, it's live, so as soon as you put in an answer survey, it's added to the uh, results. So you can either answer the survey or view the results in real time. And so for the pug survey, um, there are 904 people that responded, and this doesn't have to be a breed club member. It could be any owner that has a pug. So if the breed club advertises and asks people with pugs to answer the survey, you have a much better picture of what's going on with the breed. Um, they may ask you, uh, you know, they want to know how many pugs you own and where did you obtain your pug? Are you a member of the club? And 53% are, um, are not members, so um, what sex and so forth um, what is the general overall health? Um, they want to know about vaccinations um, and the current age, and what, or if a dog has died, at what age did they die? Was a necropsy performed? And then they get down to health screening, what health screenings are being done uh, for the, uh, the different disorders that are seen in the pug. Um, and they're asking about uh, the results of those health screenings. And then it gets down to the general conditions, cancer, gastrointestinal disorders, cardiovascular disorders, respiratory, eye, ear, neurologic, et cetera. So um, any of those categories, does, is there a disease in this dog? And then we get down to the very specifics. So when you're answering the survey, if you say yes on cancer, it'll go into the more in-depth questions. What types of cancer? Was it confirmed by biopsy or histopathology? How was it treated? Uh, GI diseases, cardiac diseases. So it gives you a lot of information about what is being seen in pugs, and you can educate yourself as well as your clients in terms of, of uh, the types of things that are seen in each breed. And any breed club can request a, a, to have a survey. Up here it says health clinics. And so we're talking about a lot of these um, a lot of these uh, databases and uh, a lot of the tests we can do in our own practices, but some of these have to be done by boarded um, individuals or are more, uh, uh, more involved. And so um, here is a list of, uh, of health clinics. So for, on uh, next Sunday, uh, Jersey Skylands Labrador Retriever Club is having a health clinic at the Blairstown Animal Hospital. They're doing eye exams with Dr. Ringel for $32, heart auscultations by Dr. Samarco for $42, echoes for $230. So it's an inexpensive way to get the health screenings done um, for people that are health conscious and want to get those things done. Uh, thyroid profile um, for $105, and then they're also doing microchipping and other types of tests in that regard. Another really good website for all health clinics in, uh, in North America is the CavalierHealth.org website. They have a, a huge database with all of the uh, health clinics that go on. And then finally, for... Um, okay... back to the home screen. Actually, I can do this. Actually, I think... Okay, we have clear by parentage, um, so that if, if uh, two dogs have DNA tests, then uh, the offspring can be clear by parentage, so the offspring uh, are gonna be normal because both parents were normal and you have to have both parents tested clear and all three, the offspring and the two parents have to be DNA um, identified to show that they are the offspring of those two parents. We have um, pre prelim information, permanent identification requirements by microchip or tattoo. And uh, if you go under the tab that was for veterinarians, it tells you how to do hip radiographs, how to do elbows, um, what are the ways to do a thyroid profile, all the specifics of the uh, genetic testing. Okay. Let's go back to here. So you can also search for a particular animal by name or registration number. And this is what I do whenever I see a new puppy in my practice. 
Uh, my staff informs the owner to bring all of the paperwork that they received with that puppy, whether it's from the pet store or a breeder or from online. And usually it will have some registration information or a pedigree or something, and you can look up the uh, information on that individual. Um, normal results are available on all submitted animals, um, but abnormal results require owner permission on the submission form. So when you're doing um, OFA evaluations in your practice, there is a line on there that says authorization to release abnormal results. I hereby authorize the OFA to release the results of its evaluation of the animal described in this application to the public if the results are abnormal. And you want to talk to your clients about initialing uh, that box because the stigma the stigma of having a genetic disease is not um, that you created genetic disease, um, and certainly we don't want your, your dogs or a breeder's dogs to have genetic disease, but if it is present, and most of these diseases are complexly inherited, if you don't know about the close relatives that are affected, even though your animal is normal, uh, you don't know the risk that's being passed down. So really, breeding does take a village. It does take um, individuals that are health conscious, that are testing, and that are releasing that, those, uh, that information. And so we do want to uh, try to um, get them to um, uh, release the abnormal results. In 2018, 24% of all HIP evaluations had authorization to release abnormal results, so one quarter of the applications. And we would like to see those numbers go up. As long as we keep problems secret, we will not be able to deal with them. And that's what you need to talk to the breeders about. Because if they're going to breed their animal and it has an abnormal result, and someone looks up the, uh, the parent, uh, parent of a puppy or looks up a prospective uh, mate on the OFA website and there's no result there, if they're breeding that animal, you have to assume that they failed that they failed their hips and they just didn't sign to release abnormal results. Because if you're breeding an animal and you're a health conscious breeder, which is, which is uh, you know, the, the, uh, the rule of the day now, then that information would be up there. So the Canine Health Information Center, or CHIC, is, uh, is a big part of what the OFA is now, so it's now become part of our logo and our title. It is, uh, CHIC is a program jointly sponsored by the AKC Canine Health Foundation and the OFA, and the mission is to provide a source of health information to owners, breeders, and scientists that will assist in breeding healthier dogs. It was initiated in 2001 as a pilot program with eight participating breeds, and today over 180 parent uh, breed parent clubs participate, and over 130,000 dogs have met the individual breed requirements and been assigned chick numbers. Chick is about encouraging health testing and awareness. In short, Chick establishes breed-specific health screening protocols as determined by the parent breed club. So it's the parent breed clubs that determine what are the important issues in the breed, um, what have genetic tests or screenings available. So again, we can't screen for epilepsy, we can't screen, uh, screen for bloat, but, uh, but hips and, and DNA tests and things like that can be screened for. It collects health test results from multiple sources, and puts them in a single um, uh, repository database. It makes the results available in an online publicly accessible database and recognizes those dogs that have been tested in accordance with a test protocol recommended by the breed's parent club. Chick is not about normalcy. It's not a stamp of approval for breeding. It's not an award program. Chick numbers do not inherently imply normal results. Dogs with abnormal results are eligible for chick numbers as well. <clears throat> so Chick is about health consciousness. If you have a health conscious breeder, they have done all the testing. And with all the tests that are available, you saw all the tests for the, the golden retrievers, it's likely that you know, every dog's gonna have some abnormal test result. There are gonna be very few perfect dogs, although we all think our own dogs are perfect. Um, but it's about identifying health conscious breeders and health consciousness in breeding, which is what's going to improve the genetic health of our dogs and cats. Chick program benefits, it's a reliable source of information regarding for breeders, prospective breeding dogs, if, if you're breeding and you want to breed a dog, and I'll show you how uh, um, the uh, um, website is very powerful as a search tool. For buyers, they're looking for health conscious testing by the breeder and healthiness of the parents. So again, when, you're, um, when you have a, a puppy that comes in, you can type in the parent's information and see what health testing has been done. 
Uh, for parent clubs, they are establishing the minimum health screening requirements for a health conscious breeder. So the parent breed club is, is promoting health by indicating um, what should be tested prior to breeding. And for researchers, it identifies specific health issues in the breeds. Have you heard of Chick prior to this talk? Okay, so we have an informed audience here. So 58% of you have heard of Chick and 42 have not. So I'm very pleased that we're able to educate you about Chick because it's an extremely important uh, tool in health conscious breeding. Okay, so let's go to the website again. Check and close this one. Okay, so the Chick program here. It's the recommended screenings by breed. It talks about the program. Okay, and if we go back to the home screen, what genetic health screens should my breed have? The first tab here is the tests by breed. Someone name a breed? What is it? Samoya. Samoya. Okay. Okay. So these are the OFA Chick health test requirements as determined by the parent club. An eye examination by a boarded ophthalmologist at a minimum of one age, uh, uh, one year of age. A hip dysplasia, either an OFA or a pen hip evaluation. Um, a um, X-linked PRA DNA test. Samoyeds have an X-linked PRA. Um, and then a cardiac evaluation, either the advanced, um, either the advanced cardiac exam, which is required to be done by a cardiologist, or the congenital cardiac exam performed by a cardiologist. Uh, these days, now that we have established the advanced cardiac exam, the cardiologist is gonna fill out that form. And then an, a uh, retinal uh, dysplasia, oculoskeletal dysplasia DNA test registered with the OFA. So those are the minimum requirements for a Samoyed. Now, of course, every single, um, for your clients, every single prospective breeding dog should come in for a breed pre-breeding health examination, where you're going to listen to the heart, where you're going to, uh, you know, to go over the dog structurally and see that there are no abnormalities, as well as go over the history for the things that we can't test for. What are the most common, what is the most common genetic disease that we deal with in practice as a chronic um, disease? allergies, okay? So you're looking at the history. Is this an allergic dog that requires medical intervention? And is it, you know, do they come in every year at the same time for the same thing for allergies? Uh, does this dog had seizures in the past? You know, look at the history to say, to talk realistically to the client and say, is this a dog that, that should be bred? Are the negatives outweighed by the positives or vice versa? So it's a very important um, aspect of us to, uh, um, to be doing for our clients. When, I, when someone says, I want to uh, purchase a puppy and I'm looking to purchase a Samoyed, I pull up the health test and requirements, I click printer friendly, and it says the OFA health testing requirements and, and print that out, and I'm not gonna print it today, and I hand it to the client and I say, if you're looking to talk to any breeder or if you're going to a pet store or if you're going online, you're gonna say, I'd like to see documentation of this health testing. And if that documentation is not there, then you don't have, I mean, it's not a guarantee, but you're not leveraging to buying a healthy dog. And so you wanna to, uh, to direct your clients to health conscious breeders that are doing health testing to make the, the best possibility that they're not gonna have these breed-related diseases. Okay. So pre-breeding 
health screening is like an equine pre-purchase examination. That's one of my new mantras, is that a pre-breeding health screening, you know, no one would buy a horse without a pre-purchase examination. You know, you, you don't know if you're even gonna be able to ride this horse or use this horse for the purpose that you're purchasing it for. So everyone that buys a horse knows that they wanna have a veterinarian do a pre-purchase examination. The same thing, if, if you're buying an animal or if you're breeding, uh, breeding a dog, you wanna know that the parents had pre-breeding health screening. And if it's not done, there, there's no way that you can say that the puppies are gonna be healthy or the kittens are gonna be healthy. Um, so it, it really is, uh, should be a non-starter um, if, uh, if uh, um, you're looking to purchase a, a dog or breed a dog. It evaluates the health worthiness of the dog for breeding. If the public demands healthier dogs, this is where it has to occur. Health conscious breeding. If the, the public says, I want healthy dogs, I wanna get a healthy dog, this has to be where it occurs. Okay, this is uh, some research that I did um, trying to figure out how much health testing is being done by breed. So what I did is I took over a three-year period from 2015 to 2017, uh, the total number of, of individual chick-qualified dogs that had all their health testing according to their parent club, divided by, I got the numbers from the AKC, the unique number of dogs that were bred that year. So it's not an exact you know, uh, number, but it's gonna give us an idea about health conscious breeding. And you also need to break down the AKC breeds by, by their um, populations, because huge population breeds, there's a lot of commercial breeding and backyard breeding going on, whereas very small population breeds, the majority of breeding is being done by the, um, by the parent club members. So this is the top 25% of populist breeds from the Labrador down to the Dalmatian. And what you can see is that there are certain breeds where a culture of health testing has gone on. Portuguese water dogs, 24% of, uh, of, uh, of the um, dogs that have been bred have passed their, um, their uh, have had their chick testing done. The Dalmatians at 21%, Rhodesian Ridgebacks at 15%, soft-coated Wheatons at 14%. So breeds that have health problems that the, that the breeders recognize they're doing their health screening. On average, 4% from this top third of the populations. The middle one-third populations from the Sharpe down to the American Hairless and the Bearded Collie, and it's a different scale here that you're looking at, um, the Belgian Sheepdog um, looks like 56%. Uh, your Bearded Collie at uh, over 40%. Your Caissons, your English Setter, your Borzoi, and so forth, your Greater Swiss Mountain Dog. So you have health consciousness going on in this group, the average is 12% of dogs that are being bred have had their chick um, uh, requirements passed, uh, their chick requirements done. And then the bottom uh, one third, the small population breeds from the Briard all the way down to the Norwegian Lundehuns, uh, look at Irish Water Spaniel, 140%, which means that 40% more of the dogs that have been bred have been health screened, which is good because the ones that are health screened and are not passing their tests, you don't want to breed, but that's how health conscious the Irish Water Spaniel people are, that there are more dogs that, are, that have um, qualified for chick than actually are being bred. And then you've got at 45% uh, your Welsh and your Glen of Amals and your Sesky Terriers and Otter Hounds and, and, uh, and so forth. And the average is 16% because these are very small population breeds, so you have a lot of, of parent club members doing the breeding. Um, in this regard. But we would like to see those numbers go up because health conscious breeding is really the way to go. Health tested parents for healthier puppies, once again. So the Chick DNA Repository, I wanna tell, tell you about a little bit. It's the collection and storage of canine DNA samples along with corresponding genealogic and phenotypic information to facilitate future research and testing aimed at reducing the incidence of inherited disease in dogs. So it's collecting DNA um, in a repository held at the University of Missouri um, that the OFA um, administrates, and, uh, and it's for future DNA research. Uh, so there was a lot of, of grant money by the Canaan Health Foundation early on to study genetic diseases, but they didn't have the DNA. It, it sometimes took 10 years to collect enough DNA in order to actually do that research. And some granted research never ever got done because not enough DNA was ever able to be collected to do that. 
So preemptively, we're saying, well, we should have generational DNA um, available on all breeds, and that's how the chick repository began. Uh, blood samples are, are, are best for the amount of DNA, an almost unlimited amount of DNA from each sample, or cheek swabs. And sam samples are stored at no charge for dogs affected with genetic disease. So if you have a patient that has a genetic disease that has Addison's or diabetes or, or something like that, and uh, aside from commiserating and, and treating and trying to help, and for some things that aren't treatable, and for for epilepsy and, and any other genetic disease in your patients, you should send in a DNA sample um, to the OFA DNA repository. And, and you fill out a health survey, um, the client does, along with the pedigree, if there's a pedigree on it, and uh, on the dog, or at least registration information. And, uh, and there's no charge for those samples for affected animals. Now you do, if you're sending a blood sample, have to overnight the blood sample, um, but, uh, um, but it's important. It's important if we're going to really make a difference curing these diseases genetically through breeding to be able to have this research done. It facilitates more rapid research progress. It provides researchers with optimized family groups needed for research. It allows breeders to take advantage of future DNA-based disease tests that become available. And that's something very important we, we stress to the breeders, is that if they submit samples on all their dogs, and, all the, and, and a lot of breeders will submit uh, blood samples on their puppies when they go in for that first vaccination, they'll get blood drawn so that entire litter is, is in that database before they go to new homes. And if they have an older stud dog or, or bitch that passed away or is no longer available, but they want to know downstream you know, what that dog passed on, um, they can contact the OFA and we can send that DNA um, for them uh, to a, a testing lab of their choice to have that genetic test run um, on their dog so that they have that um, DNA available for genetic testing. It fosters a team environment between breeders, owners, and the research community, improving the likelihood of genetic discovery. So that's just another program of the OFA. Currently, there are 27,000 DNA samples in the Chick DNA repository, mostly from blood, which is the preferred sample. 195 breeds are represented. 13 breeds have over 500 samples available. DNA samples have been distributed to over 50 research projects in over 20 institutions worldwide. So it's something that is working. So every dog has a web page. So let me just show you about individual dogs on the OFA website. So up here is where you can do your quick searches. Um, your advanced search is just to show you if a breeder um, is a a breeder of a certain breed, and they have a dog that is a carrier of PRAs, they want to breed to a non-carrier, and, and they want it to have good hips, and they want it to have different things. Um, you, you can, they can do an advanced search, they can select their breed, uh, they can check if they only want to see chick qualified dogs, um, they can uh, go through all the different um, the different databases that are available, and they can check off um, what they want in, uh, from those databases and what they want for the results. Um, animals having each of the selected reports or having any of those selected reports. So it's a very powerful search tool for the breeder. But if you're in your office and someone brings a, a, a new puppy or kitten, uh, I'm sorry, a new puppy, and, uh, and they have the parent's um, registration information or their name, let's say it's, you know, it's, uh, Johnny's Silver Girl, okay, and so you type in the, uh, the dog's name or the AKC or whatever the registration number it is, and it comes up with no entries match your search entries, please try again. That means that that dog does not have any health testing information on the OFA database. So, you know, you say to them, it doesn't look like the health testing has been done. Maybe some health testing has been done, but they haven't upload or you know, sent it to the OFA, so you print out that chick list and say, why don't you go back to the breeder and ask them for the um, health test results on these. And it does two things. It educates your client about health conscious breeding, and in many instances, it helps educate the breeder, because the breeder's now being you know, asked and said, you know, my vet said 
that this is stuff that should have been done pre-breeding on the parents to produce healthier puppies. Um, you know, can you show me the test results? And they say, well, I don't have the test results or, I, you know, or whatever excuse they give, but it puts a little pressure on the breeder to say, geez, maybe I should be doing, doing this testing. Because the testing's not expensive. Most of these are once in a lifetime tests and, uh, and you know, far less to do all of the testing, far less than what they're usually selling a single puppy for um, from these litters. I wanna show you a couple of dogs here. We're gonna start with Danik, make my day. This is one of Dr. Smith's dogs. What's his name? Hawk. Hawk. Okay, so Danik Make My Day comes up. And this is his web page. This is Facebook for dogs. This is your dog's web page. It says he's a Labrador Retriever, a male, he's black, his birthday, his DNA profile, his siren, his dam, his chick number. If you, um, for a $10 donation to the donor, uh, Canary Health Foundation Donor Advised Fund for your breed, you can put the picture of your dog up there. Why isn't your dog's picture up there? All right, okay. Um, and so, and then this shows all of the test results on Hawk. His hips are excellent, his elbow's normal, he check, he's chick qualified, PRA genetically normal for PRA, but actually she tested for PRA um, on him, and the reason for it is even though both his parents were normal, once he was bred, if you want his offspring to be uh, declared um, uh, parent-tested normal, he needs to be tested. We don't do parent-tested normal for more than one generation. There's just too many ways to get things fouled up um, with, with DNA, with parentage, with everything else. So, so we'll give one generation parentage clear. And if the next generation is going to be bred, it should be tested so their offspring can be parentage clear. You have the D locus, you have centronuclear myopathy, exercise induced collapse, advanced cardiac uh, with an echo. Then you have his parents, and it shows all the tests that his parents have had with their results. You can click on their name for their web pages or just scan the results there. It has two of his offspring. It has his full siblings, half siblings through the sire, half siblings through the dam, half siblings through the sire, very prolific, okay, lots of dogs through the dam, and then the four grandparents, and you have all the, the test information that was done on those individuals. So it really gives you a lot of information. Okay, I next want to pull up Braxfield Firepower. Oh, I misspelled his name. So this is one of my dogs, this is Forrester. And as you see, his picture is up there. It has his, inf <laughs> his information is up there. Now you see he doesn't have an OFA number for elbows because he had ununited ancanial process with grade three degenerative joint disease in his right, el um, right elbow. His hips were fair, okay? His chick qualified, he has normal uh, thyroid and dentition um, and, and surf and, and patellas, we do everything on him. Uh, and then it's got his siren dam with their test results. It's got uh, full siblings and half siblings. And you see here there's a dog with moderate hip dysplasia. And here's a dog with mild unilateral hip dysplasia. So this is why it's important to have the negatives in there. It's wonderful having a, 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 a web page with all, all the normals. But if the abnormals aren't in there, how are we helping each other? How are we understanding about risk for passing on these complexly inherited diseases? So it is important that we um, talk to our clients about authorizing the uh, um, release of the abnormal results. The last one I want to do is Farah's Starlight. And there's an article on the, on the 
OFA website um, about the hip and elbow registries that is very interesting and very informative for you to read. Um, and it uses this, this pedigree as an example. So I want to pull up this dog. This is a golden retriever and a prolific one. And I want to show you about vertical pedigrees. So you can click vertical pedigree and it actually gives you a pedigree of the dog with all the health test uh, results um, for, the, um, for the disease you're looking at. So you can do hips, you can do elbow, you can do just chick, you can do cardiac eyes, thyroid, all the other things here. So here's Ferris Stylite. He phenotypically had excellent hips, okay? His sire had fair hips, three siblings, one good, two fair, five offspring, 24 good, 24 fair. His dam had good hips, 14 siblings, eight good, five fair, nine offspring, seven good, one fair, one excellent. His paternal grandsire had fair hips, five, uh, three good and one fair sibling, 52 offspring, 28 fair, 17 good, one excellent, one mildly dysplastic. Paternal granddam fair, no siblings, three good, three fair. And the maternal grandsire, good, Six siblings, four fair, two good, 421 offspring, very prolific dog, uh, 245 good, 25 excellent, 118 fair, one moderate, one borderline, maternal grandam fair, 12 good, five fair, 15 offspring, nine good, five fair. So the pedigree is telling us somewhere between good and fair in terms of the genes that are being passed on for this dog the genotype, whereas his phenotype was excellent. So this was also a prolific dog. He had 161 offspring, and 73 of them were good, which is great. 10 were excellent, like he was. 40 were fair. So he, what he's, and you have to consider that 50% of the genes are coming from the dams, but multiple dams are being brought to him, and you have to figure the average is going to be a good dog, okay? And so he's passing on far more fair than he's passing on excellent. So his background, his vertical pedigree is telling us that he's somewhere between good and fair, and it gives us a much stronger representation of his genes than just his phenotype alone. And that's where these vertical pedigrees are important. This is in large animal, we have estimated breeding values. And, so, and some places in, the, in Great Britain, other places are trying to de develop estimated breeding values for um, uh, for hip dysplasia, the reason it doesn't work real well is that everyone has to be evaluated, including pet dogs, in order to get all this information as to who's, who's dysplastic and who's not, and you don't have all of that, so you have a lot of missing cells, and it really doesn't give you the power to make uh, appropriate EBVs. Uh, there will be genotypic breeding values based on, on gene profiles in the future that we'll be um, dealing with to select against these. But this is why the vertical pedigrees and the release of abnormal results is very important from the OFA website. And to get chick certification, you have to, um, you have to release abnormal results. So you have to check off that box um, to get that. And so if people want chick certification, um, they can fill out a form to move information to the public domain to release dogs that are already tested by OFA that have hip dysplasia, you can release that information by having your client fill out those forms as well. Okay, so finally, what is our role as veterinarians to sum up? We should embrace our role to educate our clients. The breeding of genetically healthy dogs, and the purchasing of genetically healthy puppies, or at least the purchasing of puppies from gen um, genetically healthy parents. So that the whole, it's really a whole paradigm shift that we need to make. And, and I, I don't, we don't have all the answers as to how to make that happen so that everyone that buys a puppy does some research. It, it's always such an emotional decision. Uh, you know, they, you know a, a breeder puts a puppy in, a, in someone's lap and immediately they've bonded with it and they're gonna purchase that puppy and take it home with them. And, and you know, how much do people research when they're buying a TV or buying a car or a refrigerator? You know, they, they, you know, they'll spend weeks trying to figure out which one's the best, which one should I do? And they do no homework when they're purchasing a puppy or a kitten. And, and that has to change. That needs a real paradigm shift. And we are the veterinarian 
veterinarians that need to educate our clients. And if it, if it takes, I have to be honest with you, 10% of new puppies, purebred puppies that come into my practice have any health testing at all um, being done. Sometimes it's just hips and it's not eyes and it's not all the chick requirements. At least there's something there. But 90% do not. And so I'm educating my clients for their next puppy, if they remember, okay, that, of what they should do by pointing out that there's no health testing on the parents. But it's, it's something that we need to do. We need to educate the public. We need to talk to our clients about health conscious breeding. Our greatest asset is the personal service that we provide to our clients. And that, and for those of you who are private practitioners in a private practice and not in corporate practice, or even those of you that are in corporate practice, personal service, the personal service that we deliver to our clients is what differentiates us so that, you know, I mean, I'm booked solid two and a half weeks out every single day of the year because of the service that I provide, because I talk to my clients, I explain what's going on. And this, these are things that we need to explain to our clients. The OFA provides the educational resources and the tools to assist our clients in this effort. And so I thank you for coming today to the OFA track. I hope you'll stay for the full day and become more educated on the ways that we can uh, improve the genetic health of dogs, of our patients, of our clients, of our breeder clients, and, uh, and of dogs worldwide. Thank you very much. Uh, conflict of interest, all three of us, uh, you know, the chief operating officer, the president, I'm a member of the board directors of the OFA, uh, that is the only one that gets paid, the rest of us are volunteer, right. and, uh, um, and so yes, we are all biased about the OFA. We are, we're highly compensated. <laughs> if there's questions people wanna type in or if they wanna come up afterwards, the final hour today, at the end of the day, is a panel discussion where all of the speakers are gonna be up here to answer questions about breeding, health conscious breeding, the OFA, anything you wanna talk about, um, about uh, um, uh, dogs and breeding and, and the OFA. So uh, if you wanna come back during that hour, I'm sure it will be a lively conversation. Thank you. So when asked, how do you get to the statistics page? Here's the OFA web page. What are the health statistics for my breed? Read statistics right there on the, on the front page of the website. What? So if you do read statistics, you can look up the individual breeds. You can also do the statistics for the different diseases. Is that what you're looking for? So by breed, you can also do the trends with hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia. Uh, if you're looking for thyroid statistics, English Shedder number one with 25% uh, autoimmune thyroiditis and so forth down the line. So just go to the website one night, get a glass of wine, play with it. You'll find a lot of information on there. Thank you very much.